It's great to see you, great to be here. And uh, for those who may be new guests, whatever, my name's Toby, uh, one of the leads at King's, and, uh, but not here on Sundays very often at the minute because Gene and I are serving a church down in Lowestoft for a season. And so we're there on many Sundays as well as here. But I thought we'd start this morning um, with some, some questions. All right, Generate. Who's in Generate? Well, that was not very loud, was it? Who's in Generate? Got vague. Okay, brilliant. Generate, I'm going to ask some questions, okay? And I want to see whether you get them quicker than your mums and dads and carers, all right? And the rest of the adults in the room. It's competition time. I also have sweets, just to say, this morning. It's chocolate. Probably not great in this weather, thinking about it. But um, anyway, <laughs> maybe wait till you get home before you, well, if you get um, I don't know how I'm going to do the whole thing. I'd normally forget chocolate, so this could go horribly wrong. But we'll go with some questions to kick us off, all right? First question is this, Ray. Um, ready, Generate? You've got to get this before your mums and dads and carers, all right? What is... Oh, you've got the first slide up. There should be some pictures. Are they there? Oh, they'll come. Another first slide. Very, very first slide. Go back. Back, 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 back. And there we are. There we go. There are the four pictures. Okay, so we've got an elephant up there. Okay, so first question is this. What is a female elephant called? I did get, I got a shout over there in a child's voice. Was that an adult putting, I thought maybe that was an adult putting a child's voice on just to get chocolate. <laughs> there you go. Well done. Oh, oh, sorry, yeah, it's a cow. Yeah, sorry, I thought, yeah, yeah the answer is a cow. Okay, next question. Seven dwarfs. I realise that might not be very current for younger children. <laughs> Slightly old, all right? But which of the seven dwarfs doesn't have a beard? Ooh. Sorry, I've got one over here. Who? What did you say? Dopey. Yeah, you're right. It's a twirl, all right, Linda? There you go. Yep, Dopey doesn't have a beard. I would have done a reveal, but I didn't have time. Um, how many brains? Okay, ready, ready, ready. Um, uh, generate. Okay, how many brains does an octopus have? Oh, I, I did hear someone say nine. Wow, wow. Okay, I'm sorry. I mean, the chocolate's going that way. I feel slightly bad this side, but um, there we go. Hope that's all right. Nine brains. Did you know who didn't know that? I didn't know that. Okay, you've learned. So you, hey, if nothing else today, you can go away saying you've learned something. Um, last one. Ready? What is the third planet away from the sun? Earth. I, I, I know we pipped it there, but we, I think we've got a joint one there, so we're going to go there. And there we go. There we go. Earth is. Who? What did anyone say? A different planet? No, you're like, no, I didn't say a different planet. No, no, I knew it was Earth. Of course it's Earth. Particularly if you've watched Third Rock from the Sun, the comedy show. Anyway, Earth is. Anyway, what do questions do? When someone asks you a question, what happens? Not just you get chocolate, but what actually happens when someone asks you a question? You think about something, don't you? Hopefully you do. It's sort of the questions sort of draw us in. They make us think about things. And... Um, I do wonder sometimes when we get asked questions on things, depending on the question, whether we move on too quickly from the question, or maybe answer it too simplistically, or maybe avoid the question altogether because we're just not sure we want to go where that question might lead us. And the Bible's full of questions. Now, if you're new to the Bible, to be honest, if you're old to the Bible, I've been reading the Bible for like 25 years now, I still have questions. The Bible raises questions when you read it, doesn't it? It does for me. All the time, it raises questions. But the other thing the Bible does from the beginning right through to the end is it asks questions as well. It's full of questions. If you go to the beginning of the Bible, to Genesis, there are some very simple, but genuinely penetrating questions that are asked there. As God speaks to Adam in the garden and says, where are you? Where are you? If you stop and ponder that question for long enough and think about well, where I am in life, 
where I am in regards to where God is and who God is. Where am I in my faith? Where am I? It's a deep question that requires sitting on, dwelling on for a while. In Genesis as well, what have you done? When you start reading through Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, you get to the story of Cain and Abel. Again, a really short story, but deeply profound. And in that story, God asks the question to Cain. Do you know what he asks him? Anyone know? Why are you angry? It's another good question, isn't it? Ever been angry? Yeah? Ever got angry about something or someone? That question, why are you angry? It's one of those questions. The Bible does this. We read it. It grabs us. It draws us in. These questions do exactly that as well. Then you come into the Psalms, and in, you've got Psalms full of all sorts of things, but there's many questions there. One of them is, why are you downcast, O my soul? Or why are you depressed? Why are you feeling low? Why the long face? It's one of my favorite jokes. Horse walks into the bar, and the barman says, why the long face? Sorry, I wasn't planning on that. I'm rubbish at humor. But the point is, is the Bible asks these penetrating questions that draw us in, that make us think. I've pondered the question of why are you downcast many times, genuinely. I've gone to those Psalms and asked myself that question, why am I feeling low today? Why am I a bit depressed today? These questions draw us in. And then in Jesus in the Gospels, if, you know, if you've read the Gospels, Jesus is asking questions all the time. Around 100 questions Jesus asks in the Gospels. Ending on the cross when he asks one of the most profound questions, why have you forsaken me, oh my God, as Jesus hangs on the cross? I love it. One writer put it this way. They said that Jesus not only dies giving us answers, but he dies asking our questions as well. Why have you forsaken me? That's a quote from Psalm 22, and it's worth going to read Psalm 22 to see where it goes and where that takes you, where that question takes you. But in this Roman series we're doing, we're now into chapter 8, and um, I wonder how many questions do you think Paul asks in the letter of Romans? There's a prize in this. I'm going for a flake. So we've got 50 so far. 50, lower than 50, higher than 50. 25 over here. Huh? Huh? 90, uh, higher or lower than 90, I mean, anyone, what? 160 something, no. 31, no. 120, no. Any, come on, come on, you, you must be thinking a number, yeah? Don't be, don't be worried. 70, okay. 82, okay, I'm going to put you out of your misery, but Simon is the closest. There you go, mate. 72. So you've got 70. Well done, mate. 72 questions are through the book of Romans. Interesting, isn't it? All these questions are there. They're designed to draw us in, make us think, provoke us. Sometimes they're rhetorical questions, kind of expecting a certain answer. And so what we're going to do today, we're going to look at chapter 8, and we're going to read some questions at the end of Romans chapter 8. Verse, uh, how far was on the right chapter, wouldn't it? Chapter 8, verse 31 to 39. This may be very familiar to you. You may be brand new to this, but I'll read it, and then we're going to unpack four brief questions that Paul asks. First one is this. What should we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Well, who will bring a charge against God's elect? Well, God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died. Yes, rather was raised, who's at the right hand of God, who now intercedes for us. Verse 35. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, just as it's written, for your sake, we've been put to death all day long. We're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I've entitled this preach 
a celebration of grace. Which, when you're looking at chapter 8, you might think that's a bit strange because it doesn't look like the word grace is even actually mentioned in chapter 8 of Romans. And I was really pleased, though, this morning with the songs that we started with, songs of celebration. Because the gospel is worth celebrating, the good news. That's what good news leads to. And so I want to call it a celebration of grace, and we're going to unpack these four um, quest for, for these questions that Paul asks. The first one he asks is this. He says, well, what should we say to these things? Well, if you're anything like me, it makes me ask a question. Doesn't it? Paul's asked you a question. What should we say to these things? What's the next question do you think that that raises? What are those things? Exactly. So when you're reading the Bible, when you ask a question, think about a question, answer it. Well, what is he talking about? What is actually Paul talking about? Is he talking about the last couple of verses? Verse 28 to 30, is he talking about kind of the the, the chapter 8? Or is he talking about everything he's written or or, or spoken that's been written down in this letter so far? And I would go with that. I think Paul, he's, 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 Romans chapter 8, different people have described it in different ways. But in one sense, it's like you've been climbing a mountain, you're at the top of the mountain now, and you're looking back down the mountain. And I think Paul is going, hey, in light of all of this, what should we say to these things? What's the, all of this he's talking about? Well, let me explain what's going on, I think, here in Romans chapter 8. Anyone who watched Formula 1? Okay, in Formula 1, if you know, at the end they have a celebration. And in that celebration, very famously, what they do is they shake up champagne, and as they're shaking up that champagne, they then crack the cork open, don't they? And they spray it over everyone. Being as it's a hot day... I thought we'd have a bit of fun. John's in the front row. But this is what this is like in Romans. Just try and, I'm trying to explain what the Romans is like here. Don't get preoccupied with the champagne too much. But if I shake this, what's going to happen? If I shake this bottle up, the cork is going to come off. And so as Paul goes through Romans chapter 1, I think he's looking back down the mountain, realizing where he's come from. In chapter 1, that the gospel is the power of God. Then in chapter 2 and chapter 3, I think he goes through this whole thing of leveling the playing field, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Then you come into chapter 4 and chapter 5. He says we're saved by faith, not because of anything we've done, everything Jesus has done. It's all utterly of grace that I'm made right with him. And then he goes on into chapter 6 and talks about we're no longer under sin, this slavery power that brought us into slavery that's over us. We're free from that. We're not under that anymore. We're under grace. And then he goes into chapter 7. Marcus touched on this last week. Listen to that. But the struggles that we all have in following Jesus and the battles that go on in our lives. And eventually he builds and he builds. And every time he's writing this, he's shaking, it's shaking, and it's shaking until you get to chapter 8. When he gets to chapter 8, verse 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, I'm not really going to do it, but just imagine it. Chapter 8 is like the court coming off, the pressure building up. And the celebration started. It's a celebration of grace. And in chapter 8, we get the spirit of adoption. He gives us help. I mean, chapter 8, if you compare it with chapter 7, someone once said that that comparison is the mother of all clarity. Comparison is the mother of clarity. And when you look at how many times the Holy Spirit is mentioned in chapter 8 compared with that of chapter 7, which might be once, there's about 20 times the Holy Spirit's mentioned in chapter 8. There's a marked difference going on here. And so Paul comes into that, and it's like the cork explodes out. And so Paul says, well, what shall we say to these things? Great question. What's our response? What would you say to these things that I've just said? As I was trying to give a very brief overview of Romans up to this point, what was going on in your heart? What would you say, genuinely, what would you say to the things I've just said? You might not be a Christian this morning. You might be here, you don't believe any of it. You might be sceptical about it. I get that. What would you say to these things? It's a great question. Well, for Paul, he goes on to the second question here. He says, well, if God is for us, well, who's against us? Now, when it says if there, it's not at Paul having a moment of doubt. It's more kind of in the sense of, well, in Um, you know, since God is for us, okay? I think that's the sort of way that Paul is using it. But the reality is, is that we all do have doubts and questions about things. And sometimes we do have a if, if God is for us. It might be things you're going through in life. It might be some of the things you haven't seen happen in life. 
It might be sickness, it might be pain, it might be suffering. You're thinking, well, if God was for me, surely I wouldn't be going through the things that I'm going through right now. Surely I wouldn't have gone through those things in my life. Why did that happen? Why did that happen? We've all got those. Sometimes our faith can wobble and doubts can rise in the face of disappointment, distress, and difficulty. And I'm sure there is nobody in this room that can't relate to that in some way. Sometimes in light of these things, these difficulties happening. And when you see what Paul went through who wrote these words, he did not have an easy life. Where's your faith at the moment in that? Is it, do you know God is for you? Maybe it's a sense of, as Paul kind of outlines, an awareness of our weakness, our sickness, our struggles with sin. It's a bit like I thought, you know, things can be against us in life sometimes. And we're trying to kind of do the right thing and we're trying to kind of walk in the right way. But it just feels like you're running into the wind. If you've ever done any sort of running, when the wind is behind you, it's great. It's just wonderful. It's like, I'm sailing along here. And you've got to turn around and come back the same way and it's not so easy. You're running into the wind, and sometimes life just feels like you're running into the wind, doesn't it? Like everything is against you. Sometimes it's on every front of your life. In every area, there's challenges coming at you. Things seem against you. And Paul says, ultimately, none of these things can actually triumph over you if you're following Jesus through those things. So how does he answer that so confidently? That God being for us kind of trumps all these other challenges, no matter what is coming at us. Well, in verse 32, he says, well, he did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. He goes to the cross. He goes to the death of Christ on the cross. He said, he who delivered him over, he, Jesus handed over for us. If you remember, maybe you were here when I spoke about Romans chapter 1 through to 3, and there's these phrases in chapter 1, talks about that we are handed over to the sin. It's the same word that's used of Jesus being handed over when he's handed over, when Judas betrays him in the garden, he's handed over to the, the mob, the, 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 the guard that are there. Then he's handed over to the Jewish authorities. Then he's handed over to the Roman authorities. Then he's handed over to those that are going to crucify him. Then he's finally handed over to death. He who was handed over for us, he says, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Notice where Paul goes first without going anywhere else. Things are against him in his life. He doesn't go to, I don't know, well, I've got to find the strength within. I've got to sort this myself. That's not where Paul goes first and foremost. He goes to what Jesus has done for him. And he says, hey, because his logic is this, that because God has given us his son, he could not have given any more Jesus for us in our place, well, the logic goes, surely not along, along with him, he'll give all things. He'll freely give us all things. Well, then, doesn't that raise another question, though? He's going to freely give us all things. What question does that raise? What are those all things? <laughs> what are they? Now, again, what's he talking about there? Is he just talking about the sort of what he's just written um, previously to this. And just remember that the chapter headings and the numbers were not there originally. He, Paul didn't go through and put them in. They came in hundreds of years later all right, to help us find our way around the Bible. But they weren't there. I think Paul is talking at least about everything he's written up to this point again. And if we just go to chapter 8 and we look at the all things that God gives us, what have we got in chapter 8? Well, in the face of sin, this ruling power in our life that's too big for us to deal with, he gives the Spirit, like I said earlier. 20 times the Spirit is mentioned. 13 times Christ is mentioned in chapter 8. And again, chapter 7, hardly at all. In the face of temptation, he promises to give us the grace to say no. Titus 2.11. I'm not going to spend long on these ones, but just maybe note down the Scriptures. Talk about it in your life groups or with one another when you get out of here. Romans 8, 12 to 14. He says he gives the grace to say no, that, that you don't allow sin to master you. In fact, you go back to the Cain story in, chap in chapter 4 of Genesis at the beginning of the Bible, when, when, when the God says to Cain, he says, look, you're getting angry, mate, about your brother, and um, he says that, that sin is crouching at your door. <laughs> it was right there, but you must master it. 
There's something, there's a way for Cain to walk in that he doesn't walk in. That Jesus did walk in for us, that then we can follow in Jesus' footsteps. And we don't have to allow things to master us that once mastered our lives, that dominate us. We can be free from those things. In the face of failure, he gives forgiveness. He sets us back on our feet. In the face of suffering and pain, he gives hope. Um, read Goff's book. Where has it gone? I've got it here. There you go. Loads on the back. Hope wins. Grab a copy of that if you want to unpack hope in the face of suffering and pain. In the face of weakness, he gives help. This is all coming out of Romans 8. In the face of death, he gives life. There's loads that God gives, and we could go on and on and on and on. How not along with Christ will he give all things because of Jesus, through him? Paul's confidence is that God will give him all he needs in the face of pain and problems. But wonderfully, it's not based on his own performance. It's based upon grace. And Jesus told, you know, again, the word grace doesn't appear much in the Gospels. Um, particularly Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It doesn't appear that much in there, but is grace in the Gospels? Well, of course grace is in the Gospels, because who is the Gospels about? Jesus, and Jesus is full of what? Grace and truth. So that's the point. Jesus is full of grace. He tells these stories, and he tells stories about lost sons who have gone away, who have blown everything, who come back, who find not being kicked out of the village and shamed, but a hug and a welcome back into the family. He tells stories of a praying tax man who was really just felt worthless, but he went to pray anyway, and he thought, well, I'm not as good as that really religious person over there, and I'm kind of here, and I'm praying, God, have mercy on me. And Jesus says, which one went away justified? Made right before God. It wasn't the religious Pharisee. It's the guy who cried out for mercy. Do you know it's possible to walk into church on a Sunday morning, and I know this, and to look around and think, everyone else is kind of sorted here, aren't they? People do think that. And I'm not. If they really knew me. Do you know, church is a place we can really take our masks off. Grace should lead to that, really. And I get it in terms of maybe not with everyone you don't know and you build relationships and all. I understand all of that. If I were to ask people to put their hands up who is totally sorted, I don't think anyone will put their hand up in this room, right? So if you're feeling that way at the minute, just know that it's not the case. And wonderfully, God's mercy gets directed to the man who cries out, the woman who cries out, have mercy on me. Not with flowery religious prayers, but with a heart cry for God's help. In the face of weakness, he gives help. He helps us. Jesus tells these stories of the thief on the cross who doesn't do anything apart from say, remember me. He just said, Jesus, I think you're the one I need to put my trust in. He's done nothing. Jesus tells the story of, of a guy who got into such massive debt and today he'd be millions and millions and was never going to ever pay it back. And he says his boss basically one day said, do you know what, I'm going to wipe the debt away completely, utterly. You're free from it. Jesus tells these stories because he wants us to get hold of what the grace of God is, this undeserved, this, 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 this mat, the kind of, I can't, you, you struggle with words to try and describe the grace of God. But it's kind of unexpected, undeserved gift that, that brings joy. Paul's confidence was not in himself. It wasn't in what he could do. It's sheer grace. And then Paul goes on and comes up with another question as well. He's kind of, well, if God's for us, who is against us? Well, look, if God's given us Jesus, he's going to give us all we need. And then he comes into chapter 3. Well, who's going to bring a charge against God's elect, those God has taken hold of? Okay, I need a little bit of help here now, generate. Um, I need a couple of volunteers. Should we go for four generate volunteers, please? If you can come up here, that'd be great. And we want four on this side and four on this side. We've got, we've got that, we don't have that many. So at least a couple on this side. And if you stand on the floor down there, actually, not on the stage. If you go down here, that's great. Can we have someone on this side as well? You come this side. Okay, brilliant. Okay, fantastic. Give them a round of applause for coming up here because that takes guys. Oh, no, go on. We can have another one. Go on, go on. Come on. We can have. It'll be fine. Now, I need two adult victims and um, volunteers. Oh, don't run too quickly, will you? Right, brilliant. Okay, um, now, the adult victim, the volunteers, I want you on the stage. Can you come up here? Chris, can you go there? Yeah. Okay, and Simon, can you come up here, please? And I want you to hold the target. Excellent. Okay, just hold that. I want you to hold that, Simon. So you come over here a bit more. Come over there. You want to come in front of the fan, actually, because that's not going to help. Blow. 
Ah, so there we go. Is that nice? Excellent. If you guys come over here, okay, then I'm going to give, okay, um, you guys are going to have those ones, okay, and you guys are going to have these ones. Now, the aim is, you've got to stand back. If you come stand over here, can you stand over here? Come stand here, and if you face Chris, that's Chris up there, come stand here. There we go. And what you want to do is to get the balls out of that bag, and you want to throw them at the targets, okay? Of course, try to avoid the people. Um, same with you guys. You want to throw those balls and uh, hit them at the target, and they should stick on the target. So, ready? Off you go. Go. And who can get the highest score? Off you go. Keep going. Try and get them stuck on the oh, Well done, you guys. Doing great. Try and throw them and make them stick. Maybe you've got to throw them harder. <laughs> oh, oh dear. Oh, dear. This is... Okay, you're, you're doing great, you guys. Uh, well, okay. That's okay. Don't worry. Keep going. Keep going. We've got some more balls left. Well done. Oh, dear. Something's... What's going on over here? This is not good. This is not good, is it? What happened there? Where did that go? I missed that one. Where did it go? <laughs> oh, dear. This is... Okay. How are we doing here? You've used all... I think we'll stop there. Let's call that day. Give them all a round of applause, and I think we should have some chockey, shouldn't we? Take one each. You can take one each of your chocolates. Well done, you guys. Thank you so much for your help. And well done, you lovely men. Stay there a minute. Yeah, just for a second. Is that all right? Okay, look. Here's the deal. So we've got high point scoring points here and low scoring points here. Actually, you can go. Go on, go on. You can go. Go on. I don't want to keep you up here too long. You're doing a great job. Thank you. Give them a round of applause as well, because aren't they beautiful? Um, there's a point to this that I genuinely want you to take away. Who will bring a charge against those who have put their trust in Jesus? Do any charges stick at all for the Christian? Any accusations? Anything whatsoever, whether past, present, or future? That thing that you look back on with deep regret, those accusations that might come, you think, well, I deserve kind of judgment from God on that, actually. The Bible tells us here that nothing sticks. No charges stick against those who God has taken hold of. That is the message of the gospel and of grace. And too often we walk through our lives replaying and rehearsing things that God has genuinely forgiven us for, that no longer holds against us whatsoever. Steph talked about this the other week, didn't he? That if we, if we really get grace, the next question we will ask, I think there are maybe two questions. If we really understand grace and we're starting to grab hold of it, well, hang on, if that's the case, then surely I can carry on doing stuff wrong and it doesn't matter. Well, go and back and read Romans chapter 6 and listen to that again. Now, of course it doesn't mean that. The other thing it might raise in you, though, is this is that if you have been on the receiving end of wrongdoing, you may think, well, it doesn't matter. Is this what it's saying? That God, that God forgives me, it doesn't matter. Sin doesn't matter. What they did doesn't matter. And the Bible is clear on this, that there is no condemnation for our sin. We can walk free from that. When we face God in Judgment Day, there's no judgment for that. Because, why? Because Christ has taken it. It doesn't mean there's no consequences. It doesn't mean there's no, there's no responsibility still to take. In fact, I think the Bible takes it more seriously than anything else in terms of the genuine forgiveness, the grace of God to our lives. But then some people, I've read stories of those that have maybe done things in the past and then that were, that were illegal and gone to the police and confessed for murder and things like that when they become a Christian. So they thought, I've got to do the right. They take responsibility. That's what grace should lead to. It's not, it's not diminishing it. But if you're a Christ follower, this is it. There is no condemnation. 8 verse 1. There is no condemnation. No accusations, no charges will stick. And where does Paul go to tell us about that again? Well, he goes to the gospel in verse 33 and 34. He says, how do I know this? Because God is the one who justifies, who makes us right with God. Who is the one who condemns? There isn't, because Christ Jesus, who died, rather was raised. The death and resurrection of Jesus, who now stands in the gap for us and brings us to God. That's the message of grace. Paul's reasoning here, again, is not rooted in his own performance. His confidence in God that nothing, we get it in a second, nothing's going to separate us from the love of God is not in himself. 
I was reading the, the Sunday Times, um, had this um, 35, the top 35 rich list edition. And it's just all about performance and grading people. It's those who have gone up in the rich list and those who have gone down in the rich list. And I can imagine some people reading that, finding their name, maybe going, oh dear, I've gone down. I feel bad. I only made three billion, not, not four billion. Or maybe some reading it and they've gone up and maybe their kind of like confidence goes up because they're now number two and number three richest in the UK or whatever. I think it was just UK. It's just all about performance and grading people and grace is not that. Grace does not grade people on the basis of their performance. That's not how God treats us. And I know, you've, maybe you've known this for years and years and years, but I think we just keep need to be bathing in it, as it were. Or maybe you're brand new to it. Well, let it put a smile on your face and a spring in your step and joy in your heart that actually this is the way to walk the Christian life. You're under grace. You're not under law. And then we can sing songs like, When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, would I look and see him there who put an end to all my sin, just, just everything, completely and utterly. And then Paul comes to the final bit. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Who is going to separate us? I, I sometimes talk about love like no more nails. Um, I like a bit of DIY. I like a bit of no more nails. And uh, love is like no more nails. It brings things that were once separated strongly together. Love binds. It is in the very nature of love to bind itself to another. That is in the nature of love. Love is like no more nails. And when Paul gets to this question in verse, verse 35, I think this is kind of like the, the cork flying out and the champagne going everywhere. Who will separate us from the love of God? And I want to read from the message version of the reply to that. Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? What a great question, isn't it? Do you think that anything or anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us, for you? What do you think? And Paul kind of answers it in the most emphatic way possible. Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge? There is no way. Not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing. And Paul goes on and on and on. He kind of catches everything in all of creation and says, nothing is going to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Is that good news? I know it's hot in here. It is hot in here. It's really hot off. But it is good news. And, and you can, it's not about manufacturing smart. Like, oh, yes, it's good news. No, it's not that. It's allowing that truth to seep into your life in such a way that it brings security, it brings peace, it brings that sense of I can pray out that sense of God is my Father, He loves me, He's for me, nothing's against me, nothing can separate me, no accusation can come against me. I am one who is loved by God. That's how John ended John's gospel. He referred to himself as one who is loved by God one who is loved by Jesus. Could you put your name in that? I am one who is loved by God. And then it says through Romans, doesn't it? He pours his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So shall we, we're going we're gonna to take communion actually, so I was going to say stand, but not stand, but did the band want to come back up, please? And um, these, um, Paul says in, in verse um, 37, no, verse 38, he says, I'm convinced of these things. I'm convinced, I'm, I'm persuaded of these, this truth. And again, that raises another question for me, which is, well, am I persuaded? Am I fully convinced of this truth? And where is it leading me in my life? How, what effect is it having on my life? And so we're going to take communion in a moment. There's bread and wine here. So if you're a, a Christian, you follow Jesus then come up and take it. If you're not, you, know, you sit down, listen to the band. The band will play. They'll lead us in worship. Um, but, um, so you can sit and listen. But for those who follow Jesus, I want to encourage you to come up to the tables. You might want to take it on your own. You might want There's four tables. I think there's two at the back, one at the front here, one over here as well. So just have a bit of a friendly scrum around the tables. You might want to pray with people. But this meal... This bread, this wine is reflective of the death and the resurrection of Christ. Jesus said that the bread is my broken body 
given to you. Not earned by you, given to you. This is my blood, my life poured out for you, given to you, not earned by you. And so in so many ways, this meal that we take together in this form of bread and wine is a celebration of grace, isn't it? So let's do that now. I'm just going to pray. And the band will lead us. You're going to get out your chairs and feel free to scrum around the tables. And then we'll go from there. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the, 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 the unexpected story of the gospel. Lord, this story that, um, of, of, of amazing grace, that song, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. <laughs> it's the gospel that really does reveal the worst about us. But in the context of incredible love and grace, it says, yeah, you have done that. Yes, you did say that thing. You did do that. But there's grace for that. There's forgiveness for that. There's mercy for that. If you just take hold of it. And one of the ways that we take hold of grace is simply by saying thank you for it. It's gratitude. Thank you, Jesus, for dying in my place. Thank you for grace towards me when I don't deserve it. Thank you for grace that enables me to change, the grace that enables me to walk differently with others. And I pray, Lord, that as we take this bread and wine, God, maybe it would be such a deep reminder for each one of us of your amazing grace to us for this undeserved and unexpected mercy. And I pray, Father, that by your Spirit, that it would, I don't know, go deeper in our lives. And not just when we gather together like this, but spill out then into the lives of others. We go out into the world this week. Amen. So have a friendly scrum around the tables. Take bread and wine together. Pray with one another.